So it's not, we've got Adrian Langford here, who's going to solve all our money issues, is that right? Hope to. It's all problem solved. The government keeps wanting to take it all off us, but we're going to figure out how to... Uh, yeah, we'll try to outsmart them. How to use it. So, uh, right. uh, so yeah, Adrian's going to run through some stuff. So the format for tonight, Adrian's got um, yeah, it's a good case study for us of, of uh, how we can use our equity and uh, help us with our investment properties. Uh, and we'd really encourage everyone tonight to uh, ask some questions. You know, it's obviously nice to live in a gathering, so any questions uh, from a mortgage broker. Um, you don't have to sign up for a loan tonight to be allowed to ask a question, is that right? It's preferable. Okay, okay so we'll, we'll see how we get. There's too many questions, you'll want a couple of loans written. Just tonight, I think, yeah. we'll be fine. Okay. And <laughs> amazing deals uh, from the bank, uh, every day. No, so uh, look, this is very much an information session uh, in terms of um, yeah, what's happening out in the market for mortgage. So, Right, Adrian, over to you. I haven't got any um, introduction music or anything, so we might just need a little round of applause or something. Right? Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, yes, my name's Adrian Lakeford. I'm a mortgage broker uh, with Nectar Mortgages. Uh, so I was invited tonight to give a presentation on investment lending or uh, lending for investment properties. Uh, but, but look, it's fairly flexible. Um, I do have a case study and example to run through and hope to hit on a lot of the major issues with lending. Um, so any questions that you have along the way uh, or any other associated issues that might spring to mind, please let me know and we'll, we'll try to talk about it on the way through. Because uh, I feel that like these events are a lot more, uh, run a lot better if they're interactive. Um, and if you want to relate it to your own circumstances and you have a burning question as we're going, yeah, please let me know and we'll talk about it. Okay, otherwise we should take about half an hour. So, yeah, my theme for tonight, using equity in an existing property to fund uh, a property purchase. Um, so a as we move through the examples, uh, topics we'll, we'll cover off on, uh, loan structuring, which as a mortgage, from a mortgage broker's point of view is quite important, so I'd like to talk to you about that. Um, Owner-occupied lending and investment lending, what's the difference, you know, there's different rates and different policies, we've got different lenders for that sort of stuff. So I'll talk to you about that. Uh, loan to value ratios, LVRs, so you've probably come across that, and low, loan mortgage insurance, LMI. But you know, really, what does it really mean? And how does it affect your loan? What do you need to know about it? So we'll talk about that as well. Uh, principal and interest repayments, interest only repayments, options that we have, particularly when we move into the investing sphere of lending. Uh, loan costs, often you know, we find our dream place and we, we calculate in our head what we need. Um, but there's other associated costs for the loan, and I'd like to talk to you about that, spell that out on paper. Uh, and, and look, any, anything and everything else that comes up along the way. So again, keep it interactive. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I'm, I've, I've used uh, one of Matt's properties as a case study too. Is it still available, this one? Yes, it is. It's okay. Have the contracts here at the office. Yeah, right. Well, it's a gem. <laughs> <laughs> Happy with that? Any any questions or issues at the moment? Anything that someone wants to talk about that's not on this uh, page? No? Okay. Maybe later. Okay, starting with, with equity, what is it? So, so when we talk about tapping into equity to, to fund a property, what are we really talking about? Um, so, so equity is the difference in the value of your home versus what you owe in your home. Um, I just use very simple round numbers. Your home is worth $500,000 and you owe the bank $300,000, you own $200,000 worth of that, of that property uh, and that's your equity. Um, so, so typically people talk about tapping into equity uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, now I'll just move to that slide. So people uh, say we'll use equity um, to do a number of things. Um, consolidate debt. For instance, they might have credit card debt or a car loan or whatnot. Um, your credit card debt and, and your car loan might be at a, probably is, at, at a high interest rate, whereas your home loan interest rate is lower. So people like to incorporate that more expensive debt into less expensive debt. So they use the cheaper money of a mortgage to buy out more expensive debt of their credit cards. So, so that's a common reason. Um, what we're going to be talking about tonight is to use those funds, that equity, to purchase an investment property. Uh, so a scenario where I own my own house and I live in it, and I've got a bit of equity in my home, that is, I owe the bank less than what the property's worth, 
and I want to take that difference and use it to fund my next investment property. So that, that's um, a very common reason and, and what we're here to discuss tonight. Uh, consolidate debt, we've covered uh, renovation as well. Um, you might own an investment property, uh, you bought it three years ago, um, you had good, uh, good tenants in, been getting a good uh, a rental return, you've also been uh, contributing payments to that mortgage, so you've got the mortgage down. With any lucky investment property, value has increased as well, so we now have equity in the investment property. Um, you speak with Matt, and, and Matt advises that with a, a bit of renovation, if you've spruced up the bathroom and the kitchen, put some new carpet down, uh, your investment property will increase by $50,000, and this might only cost you $20,000 to do. Um, sounds like a great idea, what do I sign? But I don't have $20,000 right now, or do I get it? This is what people talk about when they say using equity. So you tap into the existing equity from property, withdraw that out and, and put that equity to typically investment use. Some people just do it for a holiday. Like I want a new car, family to go to Thailand, and I need 20 grand. Adrian, can you refinance my house and give me this money? So that's another reason as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions? No? Okay. Um, okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty. Uh, this is where the magic happens. And again, along the way, we're, we're going to be touching some of these key points uh, with, with mortgage lending. So if there's any uh, terms or concepts that you want more information for, please let me know. Okay, so see, and this is a typical situation. So Scott, Scott's our example. He lives in Green, so it's up the road. That's his house. Nice little house in a nice street. Um, $700,000 value. That's what Matt's gone and checked it out. And Matt knows his values and he says, I for $700,000 here. Um, originally, when Scott bought the home three years ago, he took out a mortgage for $400,000 to help him purchase that home. He obviously would have had access to some other cash at that time. Um, and yeah, so his original mortgage was $400,000. Now after three years, he's been paying off his balance. Um, the, the value has also gone up because that $700,000 wasn't the value that Tommy bought it. Um, so. He, his, his current mortgage balance is three fifty. dollars uh, His repayments are $484 a week, and he has a variable interest rate home loan of 4.8%. Okay, so there's a, a lot of concepts just there. <laughs> Sorry? I said he could get cheaper than 4.8%. Uh, yeah, he can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. I, well, I, this is a typical scenario. So typically if someone got their loan three years ago, um, three years ago, 4.8%, that was pretty good fishing. Yeah, and uh, so a lot of people would have fixed in for two or three years at 4.8, or as a lot of people do, they, they take a variable rate and they just set and forget. Uh, and it's only, only now, three years later, where you know they decide, well, maybe I could do a bit better, or they start seeing an ad on TV, or they went to the barbecue and their neighbors outdone them and then they, so that they come for advice. But yeah, 4.8% three years ago is very good. Today, we'd be looking to do much better than that and saving Scott in repayments if you wanted to refinance. Variable interest rate, does everyone understand variable rates versus fixed rates? Do, do we want to talk about that? No, happy with that? Okay. Right, so Scott visits his mortgage broker and says, look, I'd like to build an investment property portfolio. What do I do? He's walked past the street, he saw this little gem, uh, Unit 579 Cleveland Street, Cooper Roo, $330,000. He says, that looks pretty good. Um, I mean, I've been hearing good things about two bedroom units. Um, I'm thinking about investment property. What do the numbers look like? Can I afford this? How do I do it? What's the next steps? Um, the unit will get information from, from, from Matt. There, the unit will rent for $330 a week. Um, he's got no savings to contribute and or doesn't want to contribute any savings. Um, he's wondering, look, I've heard about this equity. How does that work? And, and what does it look like? So a typical scenario. Agree with that? Yep. Okay, so um, my job as a mortgage broker, I, I typically start at the back end. So I, I look at, okay, so what, what's required for us to get into this investment property. What do we need? Let's look at the, at the investment property to start with. 
So, can everyone see that? It's a bit close to the edge. Um, loan mortgage insurance. So I'm gonna just talk a bit about LMI and loan to value ratios. So all lenders uh, in the country, um, where you borrow more than 80% of the value of the property, so your loan to value ratio, your LVR, is greater than 80%, the bank uh, takes out insurance against you in the worst case that you can't meet your repayments. When you're above 80% of a loan to value ratio, the bank deems you as a high risk lender. They take out insurance against you and you have to pay that insurance for them. Uh, so it is an unwanted cost. Um, now most people entering property do pay um, loan mortgage insurance because typically their LVRs are above 80%, particularly first home buyers. Um, but look, as an investor, and ideally, we like to secure loans for less than 80% of the value of the property so that we can avoid this cost. Um, and, and look, a, a, a loan mortgage insurance cost will vary. So it starts at um, zero at 80%. And it maxes out typically at 95% is typically the most that you can borrow from a bank, depending on the lender. Um, zero loan mortgage insurance at 80%, at 95%, depending on the value of the property. And, and on this, I would say it would be in the order of about $15,000. And it's, it's a sliding scale in between. Um, there is a bit of a step jump at the 90% mark. And if we have to pay loan mortgage insurance, we want to get our LVR just below 90%, because uh, there is a bit of a step change there. But look, it really depends on your loan amount uh, and what your loan to value ratio is. Um, but in this case, if, if, um, if Scott wanted to take it to say 90%, um, yeah, look, he would be in the order of $10,000, I would imagine, from 90%. That's a year. No, it's a one off cost. Right. So, lo lo uh, loan mortgage insurance, um, one off cost. Typically, for owner-occupied lending, so buying your own property to live in, the bank can, will lend you that money and they'll put that money back on top of your loan. Uh, in the case of investment lending, they'll do that as well, but most banks won't, let, won't lend you more than 90% of the value of the property. Um, so if you want to put your loan mortgage insurance back onto the loan, you, you need an LVR of, say, 85% um, and enough room to put that loan mortgage insurance cost back onto the loan. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay, so, so Scott says, look, um, I really don't want to pay this loan mortgage insurance. Adrian, what do I do? Okay, I say, well, we need an LVR of 80%. So, our loan value was 330. Our max loan amount can only be $264,000. That's 80% of the value of the property. Um, now, he says, okay, well, what about interest rates? Um, so investment interest rates, they're typically a bit more than owner-occupied investment rates. Owner-occupied, you're gonna live in your property. Investment is you're gonna rent it out. Um, early, at, at the moment, look, I've got 30 lenders on the panel, and look, it varies, and it really depends on your circumstances and the policy of that lender uh, and the discounts that, that we can try to negotiate on your behalf, depending on your circumstances. But generally speaking, at the moment, for investment lending, um, low, low to mid fours is, is pretty much the mark. I've picked out a nice conservative rate here of 4.19% for investment lending. So $264,000 over 30 years, variable interest rate at 4.19%. The repayments, principal and interest, so paying the interest and also paying down the principal of the loan, $297 a week. If we go interest only, which we can because it's an investment property, it's $212 a week. Which is, which is pretty good. Um, when you consider that we're getting $330 a week rent and our interest only mortgage repayments are only $212 per week, that's what you consider to be a positively geared investment property, which, which again is another good thing. Um, look, I, I've done this 6.5% gross annual return on the loan amount. I mean, obviously there's other considerations, but on, on the loan amount, it's, um, it, it's pretty good. So what does Scott need to make that happen? So if we've got a $330,000 purchase price, 
our max loan amount is only 264. Um, so we're missing $66,000. So he's going to need to contribute the remainder, the difference between the loan amount and the property value just to, just to buy the property. He's got to get that money from somewhere. Uh, and then there's also associated costs. So you've got stamp duty. Now stamp duty for investment properties in Queensland, it again is slightly higher than stamp duty for unoccupied properties. In this case, stamp duty in Queensland for this amount, uh, it was just shy of $11,000. And I've also added another $3,000 to cover off legal fees, if you might want to building a pest report. Um, there's an application fee for the mortgage. Three grand should pretty much cover us. So you really need $66,000 plus another $14,000 of extras, total of $80,000 to get himself into that property. There's a lot of calculations there and it it's, um, can actually be quite complex. Um, is there any questions or issues? Any, any thoughts? Does, does, it, does it make sense on paper? Yeah, yeah? okay, great. Is there, is there anything that the bank wouldn't lend you for in terms of um, the costs associated with purchasing? They then the stamp duty, there, there's nothing that they say that, that in terms of lending. No, they, they're happy to lend you any of the, they'll, any of the costs. Yeah, the they'll, they'll lend you anything required to purchase the property, <coughs> provided so that we don't go over the maximum LDR. So in, for investment lending in this case, provided we're going to go over 90% LDR, um, yeah, you, you, can use, you can use that loan amount if they give you for it. Well, being as very helpful as you're going to be, where is your commission in that? Oh, okay, yeah. That's, that's always the first question I get asked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so <laughs> um, well, from, from the customer's point of view, it, it, there's no catch at all. There's no cost to the customer. So typically how a mortgage broker works and how I work is that uh, I um, match you up with your best option. So I'll generate, um, I'll receive a scenario like this and I'll generate two or three of what I think are the best options for you. Um, the customer then decides what they want to do. We make an application to the bank. The bank then pays me a commission for introducing you as a customer to the bank. Now, for me, it doesn't matter which bank you go to or what rate you take or the particulars of the loan. It doesn't really bother me because the commissions are, are, are largely the same. Mortgage brokers get an upfront commission, which is a percentage of the total loan amount as an upfront commission uh, payment, um, number one. And then number two, there's a trail payment, which is an ongoing fractional percentage of your on ongoing monthly loan remains. So, so that's how people like me earn money. It's commission based. Um, the bank pays it, not you. I've got a question about the stamp yep. duty for the investment yep. property. What's the difference between an owner occupier and the investment? What's the difference in stamp duty? Yeah. Exactly? Yeah. All right. Um, you give me one second. So it's standardized. Yeah, I've got a brilliant app here. Uh, just give me one sec. Stamp duty. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a big difference. Um, Queensland's quite severe, the difference between investment and owner occupied. So, for this case, I've got if it was owner occupied, um, the stamp duty is $3,300. There's a registrar, there's a transfer registration cost of 645, mortgage figure 168. Total, um, comparable to this total figure, is $4,104.20. Yeah, it's a big difference. Yeah. Worthwhile moving in for six months. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so, so two principles here for, for Scott to get this without outlaying any cash, he needs that grade. Yep. Okay, so let's look at refinancing his existing loan to access that 80000 Scott owes $350,000. He needs another $80,000 to cover all associated costs. So my refinance loan amount is $430,000. So refinancing, what I'm telling Scott is, I'm gonna, well, not me, but a bank is gonna buy out your existing mortgage. And when we buy your existing mortgage, we're actually going to buy it for more money than it's worth 
then I'm going to give you the change. The bank's going to give you the change. So th that's essentially what we're doing with the, with the refinance. Um, the loan to value ratio for this new refinance is, is great, it's 61%. So we've got $430,000 over a $700,000 value. Great, it's under, it's under 80%. No loan mortgage insurance, so happy days. Scott's happy there. Now, uh, again, um, there's better rates on offer than this uh, for owner-occupied lending. Again, I've, I've taken a typically achievable owner-occupied rate as of today of 3.99%. So $430,000 over 30 years, at a variable owner occupied rate of 3.99 equals repayments of 473 per week. And that's principal and interest. So which would be probably most likely similar to his original loan. Um, and banks, most banks these days, uh, if you're buying owner occupied, they'll want you to do principal and interest. Or at least a component of the principal. Um, so in Scott's case, is that on paper it's actually pretty good news because it, it gives him a saving of $11 per week on his existing repayments, even though he's getting an extra $80,000 out. There, there's a bit of magic behind the scenes to this. The reason for this is because he took his loan out three years ago, he's been paying 4.8%, he's paid down the principal of that loan. So that's where some of that saving is coming from. There's also a lot of that saving is coming from a, a, a much better interest rate as well. Okay, so, so in summary, with this, we tell Scott, well, yes, we, we can do this deal, certainly. Let's refinance your house. Your repayment's gonna be roughly the same. So your out-of-pockets week to week is, is really no different. It's actually a little bit less. Um, we'll put you into this, uh, into this investment property on Cleveland Street. Um, the rent from Cleveland Street is, is gonna pay for the mortgage. Uh, and in fact, it's gonna generate a, a small surplus there. And that might be enough to pay your body corporate and do some maintenance here or there. Uh, so, you know, the property is pretty much holding its own uh, and some and, and your, yes, your, your loan has gone up over 30 years. Um, however, if you look in terms of expenses today, you, it's exactly the same. Does that make sense? Is that, yeah, thoughts or comments, questions, concerns? All right. Normally when I'm sitting down in someone's lounge room, we get to this stage, uh, oh, what about this and that? And there's all sorts of questions. No? Okay. Um, just a few other things, like um, again, this is my role as a mortgage broker, which is probably a bit different to the banks, is I also look at, at, at things, at your loan structure. Um, I'd always suggest to Scott that these loans should be standalone, in that they, they support themselves, that is they match, they comply with bank policy in their own right. Uh, if you walk into a branch of a bank, typically, um, they'll ask you or want you or encourage you to cross collateralize your security. So what that means is they take the value of, of your own occupied property plus a new investment property and they add it together. When they add together your uh, existing loan amounts and your new loan amounts and they use that for the purposes of working out your LVR. Um, and sometimes that has advantages because sometimes um, you, you know you've got you can essentially buy your, your second property at, at 100% at or get a mortgage for 100% of the value of your second property because you can spread that equity across both loans by cross-collateralizing. Uh, so sometimes it, it has its advantages, but typically we advise against it um, because you can come unstuck in the future. And, and typically we see situations where someone's entered into a situ situation like this, but the loans are cross-collateralized um, Scott wants to sell one of the loans in the future. All the equity is on one property and not the other. So if he sells um, the property that has equity, he, he'll, he'll get a bit of a profit, but then the bank will ask him to put some money back in against the other loan because that loan now independently is non-compliant with, with bank policy. It might be 100% loan to value ratio or worse, it might be negative equity. So the bank will want you to correct that and typically how you correct that is you have to give them a lump sum of cash uh, to, you know, to bring the value of loan, uh, the value to the loan ratio down. Um, it becomes really important if you're moving into your second, third, fourth property. Uh, you want a situation where you have flexibility to apply, to refinance different homes at different times and apply different rates for different reasons or sell um, at different times. 
Uh, so I'd always encourage you to, to look at making them standalone loans. Um, Scott always up, also asks about loan splits, um, which when we get into investment lending is also a good idea. So a loan split in this case would be when we refinance this amount of money, it's one loan, but we split the loan two ways. We have a loan for $350,000 split one, and then I have a split two investment loan for $80,000. So, so that will on paper separate out the purposes of the loan and we can say, well, this portion, the 350 grand, is for owner-occupied lending, whereas our second portion for $80,000 is for the investment lending. So when you get a tax man at the end of the year, it's all spelt out. You can say, well, here's my investment loan that I've got, but also on my owner-occupied mortgage, there's an investment split here. So I, I want to, you know, this investment split should also be attributed to my investment property for tax purposes. Um, excuse me, I have a question. So therefore, are they different rates? Yes, yep, they are. If, if you want to take advantage of the tax, yeah. So that's a personal choice. Some people say, well, I just want the owner-occupied or I don't care about tax. And because the majority of this loan is for owner-occupied purposes, we can put it through its own occupied. But then some people, particularly with uh, more than one investment property, it's all about tax, not all about tax, but it's very important. Um, and they'll, they'll want to split so they can go to, when they, for tax time, they, they can use the full amount of this $80,000. Um, but, but it's actually, even though, yes, that's investment rate, it's actually not too bad because our investment rate for this, on this example, is 4.15%. And over the $80,000, I haven't worked it out, but it, it, it wouldn't be a great deal of money. Extra in repayments a week. And would there be potential that they're paying interest only? Correct. On that yep. amount then? Yes, definitely. Bank of Queensland has a good deal at the moment. Yeah. It's got to be fixed, and their policy is pretty tight. They've got other policy re restrictions. Um, they want to cross collateralise your properties. Um, generally speaking, no. Rates, I find uh, there's a lot of room for negotiation of rates at the moment. Um, and part of my job is that I, first of all, we work out the loan structure and not even talk about banks. Uh, then I'll take that to individual banks and negotiate rates. So, you, you can get pretty close. Uh, some banks might even match it, but generally speaking, no. And is that cross collateralisation is in the bank's interest in terms of security over multiple properties? Is that yeah, they... so as I've been told by um, people that work in the bank, um, the ideology behind that is the bank then has more control over, over your security. And they know then that's really hard for you to refinance one of those loans out. Um, so you know they, they've they're sort of weaving that web if you like, and they'd like to give you a credit card and do the general banking uh, and create this uh, environment where it's really hard for you to leave. And that, that's fine. That's business. Um, I think as an investor, though, you just need to be aware of it and decide is that for me or is it not for me. And if it's not for me, well, how do we have? Excuse me. How do we structure that up? Um, any more questions on this page? No? All good? Okay, and I thought I'd just speak generally about um, investment lending. And again, if you have questions about owner occupied or anything else, bridging loans, whatever, oh, we can talk about that as well. Um, so, yes, LVR for investment lending is um, it, it's more restrictive than owner occupied. So with our own occupied, we, we can, there's a number of banks that will give us 95% of the value of the property plus uh, LMI on top of that. And you, you can, you know, with, with that, you can almost get 100% loan. With investment, no. The max I'll give you is 90%, it is, is, good, is good fishing. Some banks are 80%. And uh, there is some circumstances where it's even lower. So at the moment, um, there's a number of, particularly the, the mainstream lenders who are a bit shy about some of the high rise going up in the CBD, in the 4,000 postcode. Um, and we haven't seen that fully play out yet, but I would imagine as, as time goes on, the LVRs required to purchase one of those properties will be even lower again.
and they'll, they'll start really turning the screw on that sort of lending. Okay, yep. Um, yeah, uh, investment rates are typically higher than owner-occupied rates. Uh, again, it um, comes down to negotiation as well. But generally speaking, you're gonna pay more for your investment property and rates. I, I suppose the trade-off is, is that you can, as Matt alluded to, you can get an uh, interest on the repayment as opposed to princi principal interest. Go some way to, to offset it. Um, I, I will say that again, the, the, the gaps in the rates aren't huge in the moment, at the moment. So in this example, 399 versus 4.15, um, you know, depending on your loan, that, that's 20, 30, 40 dollars a month on the back end. It's not really a great, it's more money, but it's not dramatic. Um, also, um, I haven't touched on tonight about general policy, but, but servicing is quite a big issue when, when we go to a bank seeking a loan. Um, so people, when they want to jump into investment property, typically have the idea, well, oh, look, the, the rent will pay for itself. And in this in, in, uh, example of Cleveland Street, it does. Um, just be mindful that most banks will only take 80% of that value of that rent. So $330 a week times 80% for the purposes of you passing their assessment test as to whether or not you have enough income uh, to, to service the loan. So it's just something to keep in mind. And, and again, when you go sit down with your bank or visit a mortgage broker, uh, the, the calculations supporting your application are very important. And in investment, they're, they're a bit different to an unoccupied house that's been supported by a salary. Any other thoughts on, on inv uh, investment lending? But that's that's pretty much um, my presentation on investment lending. But I'm very much happy to talk about anything else. You say that eighty percent of the rent is that the gross rent or the gross? No, gross rent. Uh, so yeah, what's required typically is uh, an appraisal from real estate signed on letterhead. Um, you, you come down to the office here. They they draft you up a one pager. It's got Matt's name on it and his, his letterhead, and he signs off, and that, that's good enough for the bank. Uh, just a question about the uh, cross collateral loan. Yeah. Is it easy enough to, um, yeah, to <laughs> get scandalized? Yeah, yeah, to yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it, it depends on, it depends on your circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, what you would need to do is, is follow a, a similar process to this. Yeah. So you would need to refinance. So L L and I was not like below eight percent. For both. Yeah. Oh, if it's below eighty percent for both, it's fairly straightforward. Yeah. yeah. And if you were looking at to use that as a, for equity for another property. Yes. How does that work when they're looking to the cross collateral? Oh, okay. Look again, it, it depends on your circumstances. But if you had a situation where uh, your loans were clumped together, mm -hmm. um, however, in the the ultimate value of those properties and the ultimate, um, what you add on those properties was below 80%. Um, yeah, one, we could refinance and distribute that equity across both loans independently and have two independent loans. Um, depending on if you had more space as well, you could potentially use that extra capacity, another split, say, mm -hmm. for cash in your pocket, for yeah. whatever, renovation, yeah. or, or um, as a deposit for your next property, or yeah. holiday, yeah. whatever people use it for. So when um, um, taking a cash surplus in your pocket, um, you, you can use it for whatever you want. Now, we, we typically tell the bank it's for future investment purposes, and, and they like that. Mm -hmm. um, any, anything house-related, so investment-related, uh, purchasing an investment property, no worries. Um, people who are getting cosmetic surgery or whatever, the, the bank's probably going to say, well, you know, really? But, you, you know, <laughs> yeah. it can work. Yeah. <laughs> now, moving on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, look, that, that's that's the presentation tonight. Questions, comments, thoughts, concerns, abuse. <laughs> <laughs> I have a final question. Yep. The um, mortgage insurance premiums are enormous. Is there any information or insight into what sort of loss the mortgage insurers? Uh, encounter with uh, defaulting loans. I would, I would love to see it. <laughs> I, I think they're ahead, aren't they? Uh, yeah, they might be ahead. 
Well, I'm not thinking about my mortgage insurance, so that's my phone vibrating. Um, if you, when you buy your property the first time and you buy it 95%, you, you're going to pay your loan mortgage insurance. So insurance has been taken out for that property. Yes. But if you then refinance with another lender, the, the next lender is going to say, okay, well, if it's above 80, I need loan mortgage insurance again. So you, you've effectively then got two policies for the life of the loan on, on the same property achieving the same thing. So yeah, we'll, as mortgage brokers, we don't like loan mortgage insurance. And I would always advise where possible, we, we minimise it or we don't pay it. And again, that comes back to your loan structure. Is there a tiny bit of flexibility there in the banks? Like, you know, I've heard from some buyers that they've got away with and the banks have a tiny bit of flexibility on, on that LVR. On the LVR? Oh, I just in terms yeah. of whether the mortgage insurance oh, is payable. In. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty rigid. That's pretty rigid. Uh, if there is any flexibility, it wouldn't be from the mortgage insurer's end. It, it might be from the bank's end. Um, some banks at the moment, it's actually quite competitive market. Uh, and some banks are offering to pay some, some incidental fees waive charges, etc., cetera, um, pay application fees. So there could be some of that going on where a, a bank at the retail level might subsidise it, but, but no, I dare say they've still got to kick up to the mortgage, loan mortgage insurer. I'll, I'll steal another one quickly. Same time. Everyone else is going to go. Um, is, is that legislative that, that mortgage insurance is required to be paid or is that just something that is developed in terms of the banks just like yep, you've got me. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Uh, is it legislated? Like it's just a given, isn't it? I don't think yeah. it is, Matt. I don't know. It's, 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 it's just a policy of every bank. It's, 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 it's just become a type. It's just a double security for them. Yeah, because yeah, I'm sure the banks like it to sound like it's legislated. Has something to do with it? Yeah. It is just their criteria. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's. Like again, as a broker, we don't like it, and we, we try to we minimise it as much as we can. Um, I, I don't, I actually don't know of anyone as an individual who's personally benefited from having a loan mortgage insurance policy. Um, I mean, because it benefits the bank at the end of the day. So like, as the individual, it doesn't really help you. Yeah, I just find it because when they talk about housing affordability mm. and people getting into property, etc., and it's just such a massive cost. Yeah, um, it's one of the big and. For a lot of first home buyers, they've got to pay that. They've got to yeah, that money, right. don't they? Well, typically it is first home buyers because they'll yeah. have less of a deposit. Well, they've got no equity, so they they borrow that ninety five percent LVR, um, which can be quite scary for first home buyers moving to their first property. That they've got you know very little equity in the home. They, there's not a lot of buffer there for them to um, you know to roll with some of the punches in the market. Uh, plus, yeah, they've got. Yeah, loan mortgage insurance. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, the bank just works it on the loan. Yeah. So you've got it overseas. Yeah. You've, you've got it overseas. You, know. you should be yeah. thankful. Yeah. <laughs> that's, how, that's how I sell it. <laughs> I say, here's a loan mortgage insurance amount. People freak out. Like, oh my God. It's $6,000. And so it's over 30 years. <laughs> and that you pay back over the 30 year loan. Another question if one's got an investment property and uh, interest only loan. Yes. Uh, is there a certain time period the bank wants to be that to be refinanced? Oh, you mean to move to principal interest? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, typically you can go up to a five-year term interest only. Um, Pretty standard. It, it, it's fairly standard, and I mean, not, I find that normally by year two or three, uh, people are looking to refinance. In any case, um, I, I like to what. Well, tell people that when we're working together that we, we want to revisit those circumstances every several years and just see if we can save on repayments or put them into a better situation. So if you look at it from that point of view that if um, the average uh, homeowner is not going to stay with the same mortgage for the life of the loan, then theoretically you could theoretically keep rolling that out. <coughs> And then, I mean, eventually you've, you've got to... Yeah, you can't roll over either quite yeah, a sizable investment on after the first five years and then they say, like I said, I don't want to be paying, I don't, can't afford to put the, what do you call it, the uh, interest and the... Yeah, um, principal? Uh, cut yeah. The principal. And they say, oh, you can roll it over another five years. Yeah, so they've already just yeah, refinanced you 
from under five years. Yeah. 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 What we, oh, I would advocate definitely doing that. Um, I think it's quite a size of a level too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, it's, it's really good. You have to keep your... Um, so they, they were the first time. Yeah, so uh, in, in my role, I, I wouldn't just say, let, let's, if you're coming off the bank, let's just roll over and come off the bank again. I, I would ideally open it back up to all the lenders because we find in the market uh, at any given time, there'll be certain promotions, deals, specials. Westpac at the moment has a fantastic... Um, own occupied variable rate, uh, 3.75% it is. Uh, it's, they guarantee that rate for two years. Uh, they guarantee the discount for two years on their standard variable. And that's a really good rate. But in six months time or 12 months time, I can guarantee that won't be the best rate in the market. And someone else will take that turn of, of leading. I think the, just the differences between uh, taking our typical mortgage as your Talking the investment mortgage or owner occupied versus a line of credit, yeah. um, the advantages, disadvantages, and probably applicable interest rates. Yeah, sure. I was only going through this today. Good question. So, uh, a line of credit uh, it's essentially a credit card without the card with the bank. So, you say you might get pre approved for $100,000 with the bank, and the bank says, okay, we've uh, seen your financials, yeah, you can cover 100 grand anytime you like. Uh, you can, um, we'll give you $100,000. Uh, and then your repayments only kick in on your balance if you have a balance at any given time. So if, you, uh, if your balance is zero, you're not making any repayments. But if you start drawing down that line of credit, that's where your repayments start. So typically, yeah, interest rates are typically um, a little bit higher than for straightforward owner occupied um, residential mortgages. Um, however, they're not as severe as credit cards, which people use credit cards for that purpose as well. Mm -hmm. You know, just whack on the credit card and not pay it off. So it's the same sort of... I would suggest, however, I mean, obviously depending on your circumstances, is to, uh, I think it's more beneficial to take that money out through a process similar to this, or cash out of your existing loan, uh, and put that money in an offset account. Because that way you're still getting the benefits of reducing your interest and you've got that money at a home loan rate, not a line of credit rate, or not your credit card rate, um, and you can just pay it off as you do your mortgage. Um, so, I mean, as you, if you've got 100 grand sitting in your offset account, um, you get the full benefit of 100 grand off your interest, you might draw it down to 90, and you're only missing that 10% benefit back off your interest saving, which is a much better outcome than paying the full line of credit interest rate. So, I, I mean, it obviously depends on your circumstances, but I would suggest that. Where I see it typically is um, someone like a builder. They have a line of credit because um, their, expense, their expenses and their income is varied month to month. And this month they might have a $30,000 bill. Uh, and, and next month they might get a $50,000 check. But they, they need that little bit of play there for them to be able to whack down a whole lump sum of cash. And for them, you know, something like a line of credit is pretty good. Um, but again, if it's for investment purposes or something like this, I'd say, I'd say an offset. Have those funds ready to go. They're offsetting your mortgage, just like it's in your mortgage anyway. You can use it whenever you want. Hmm. That was a bit of a long-winded answer. I hope, uh, I hope it all made sense. Anything else? Where do you see rates sitting? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, again, I'm not allowed to give financial advice, and, uh, and, I, and I don't, and I wouldn't anyway. Um, but but like the, the indications that, that I see, and from what I hear, um, and also the setting of the fixed rates, I think is a, is a telltale sign. Um, uh, you know, it seems that there might be downward pressure on rates. How how far it is is uncertain. Um, I think variable rates at the moment are a good option. Some people like the security of fixed rates and there's some fa fantastic deals with fixed rates. Um, we're doing some Commonwealth Bank pricing at the moment, 3.74% uh, over two years. Uh, that's a negotiated pricing request. And um, yeah, that, that's a great rate, you know, 3.74%. Like so pe some people who are going for those low fixed rates are doing so, one, because they're historically the lowest rates ever on my part, um, but, but also they really want that security. And they just want to know, well, for the next two years, I'm only paying this amount of money. Whereas that variable, it's always unknown, isn't it? We, we, is it going to go down? 
people think it is, we really don't know. What, what's the longest period of fixed term? Yeah. You can go as much as five years. Um, again, I, I caution anyone over about the three year mark. And the reason being is the break costs. So uh, I was only speaking with a young person recently who was with Credit Union Australia uh, with a fixed rate for five years. Uh, and they locked in, at, 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 I think it was 4.85, 4.9, something like that. Uh, and they said, oh, look, I really want to refinance. I see these ads on TV. How much can I save? And I said, you know, can save a heap. Um, then it's, she was, I think, two years in to the five year term, less than halfway. <coughs> uh, the break cost was $17,000. So CEO was going to charge her $17,000 to break that fixed period. Mm. And, and that's the real, that's the drawback with, with fixed rates. And are they still staggered? They decrease each year? No, no, when you're fixed, you are fixed. It's locked in. So if uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia sets the cash rate, cash rate at the moment is 1.75%. So banks then, uh, theoretically, uh, their, their retail lending follows that. And it's typically about the sort of 2% extra because they're making sort of 2% profit on the lend. So that's why rates are around that sort of at best 3.75%. Um, so and that, that's, that's the advantage of a variable rate. So you lock in now, if the Reserve Bank drops the cash rate and I'm with Commonwealth Bank, then Commonwealth Bank, they're not obligated, but they should, that's what they do, drop their rates as well. And so I receive that benefit. Conversely, if the RBA lifts rates, the banks are definitely gonna follow suit and they're gonna lose their variable rate. So with the fix, it takes a lot of stress out. And you say, well, 3.74 for, for two years, yeah, I can live with that, lock me in, and let's look at it in two years' time. So that, yeah, variable versus fixed. Uh, there, there's possibly an argument for uh, splitting the loan to, uh, yep. uh, yep, in an upward market, but in a trend possibly down, is that just as valuable? It's, it's always, it's just as valuable. I think it works both ways, and it's individual preferences. Where I find it applied, is where people are thinking much too hard about which way to go and they can't make up their mind. <laughs> and we say, look, just split it. Let's take, let's do a split. 50% of your loan can be variable, so you'll get the benefit it goes down. But otherwise, let's lock in at one of these fantastically low like, fixed rates and you're going to get that benefit as well for two years. Provided that you don't want to mess around with your loan for, for the next two years, it's a good thing. And in two years' time, you'll come off your fixed period and that fixed uh, portion of your loan will revert back to the standard variable rate of the day. At that stage, we'll sit down again and go through it again. And we might decide to do the same thing with another lender. We might decide to fix it all somewhere else or make it all variable somewhere else. Hmm. Very good. Any more questions? Are we good in the grilling? Yes, we're good. Hey, um, thanks, Adrian. Uh, round of applause. I think it's really <laughs> I think I'm waiting to hear some of that. So. We've got a little gift for Adrian for coming in and speaking. We do appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming time. out tonight. So, um, yeah, good. I hope that's good information for everybody. I always get a bit depressed when you talk to mortgage broker and he mentions these 3.7s and 3.6s. <laughs> scratch my head thinking, hang on a second, what are the, I'm sure my numbers are higher. Than that. <laughs> that's because you got money in the bank. It's just depressing. No, the numbers are always lower. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's me. You got to the right person. Sales, sales. Is that what it is? So, hey, yeah, really good information. Um, yeah, I hope that's been inside for people. I haven't dealt with a mortgage broker. Just the the value. Is said 30, 30 plus lenders that you uh, are thirty plus with. lenders. So, uh, I think an advantage of a broker as well, just briefly, is on my panel we have two specialist lenders um, outside of the APRA regula regulations. Their policies are a lot freer in terms of lending, and we can handle you know, some of those really unusual situations that, that you wouldn't be able to get funding for in a mainstream branch. Um, so yeah, we, we tend to either on price or on, um, or on flexibility is where mortgage brokers do a lot of their work. Yeah, yeah, interesting stuff. Hey, uh, thanks everyone for coming. We've we've got some coffee. We've actually got some cake. Kelly's got some nice cake there. So please hang around and have coffee and a cake. Uh, we'll be here to have a chat. So thanks everyone for coming. We'll see you next month.